Chapter Eight of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Eight. Our plot is a good plot as ever was laid. Our friends true and constant a good plot good friends and full of expectation an excellent plot very good friends henry the fourth part one no sooner had the general acclamation of joyful surprise subsided than silence was eagerly demanded for reading the royal commission and the bonnets which hitherto each chief had worn probably because unwilling to be the first to uncover were now at once veiled in honour of the royal warrant it was couched in the most full and ample terms authorising the earl of montrose to assemble the subjects in arms for the putting down the present rebellion which divers traitors and seditious persons had levied against the king to the manifest forfulture as it stated of their allegiance and to the breach of the pacification between the two kingdoms it enjoined all subordinate authorities to be obedient and assisting to montrose in his enterprise gave him the power of making ordinances and proclamations punishing misdemeanors pardoning criminals placing and displacing governors and commanders in fine it was as large and full a commission as any with which a prince could entrust a subject as soon as it was finished a shout burst from the assembled chiefs in testimony of their ready submission to the will of their sovereign not contented with generally thanking them for a reception so favourable montrose hastened to address himself to individuals the most important chiefs had already been long personally known to him but even to those of inferior consequence he now introduced himself and by the acquaintance he displayed with their peculiar designations and the circumstances and history of their clans he showed how long he must have studied the character of the mountaineers and prepared himself for such a situation as he now held while he was engaged in these acts of courtesy his graceful manner expressive features and dignity of deportment made a singular contrast with the coarseness and meanness of his dress montrose possessed that sort of form and face in which the beholder at the first glance sees nothing extraordinary but of which the interest becomes more impressive the longer we gaze upon them his stature was very little above the middle size but in person he was uncommonly well built and capable both of exerting great force and enduring much fatigue in fact he enjoyed a constitution of iron without which he could not have sustained the trials of his extraordinary campaigns through all of which he subjected himself to the hardships of the meanest soldier he was perfect in all exercises whether peaceful or martial and possessed of course that graceful ease of deportment proper to those to whom habit has rendered all postures easy his long brown hair according to the custom of men of quality among the royalists was parted on the top of his head and trained to hang down on each side in curled locks one of which descending two or three inches lower than the others intimated montrose's compliance with that fashion against which it pleased mr prynne the puritan to write a treatise entitled the unloveliness of lovelocks the features which these tresses enclosed were of that kind which derived their interest from the character of the man rather than from the regularity of their form but a high nose a full decided well opened quick grey eye and a sanguine complexion made amends for some coarseness and irregularity in the subordinate parts of the face 
so that altogether montrose might be termed rather a handsome than a hard-featured man but those who saw him when his soul looked through those eyes with all the energy and fire of genius those who heard him speak with the authority of talent with the eloquence of nature were impressed with an opinion even of his external form more enthusiastically favourable than the portraits which still survive would entitle us to ascribe to it such at least was the impression he made upon the assembled chiefs of the mountaineers over whom as upon all persons in their state of society personal appearance has no small influence in the discussions which followed his discovering himself montrose explained the various risks which he had run in his present undertaking his first attempt had been to assemble a body of loyalists in the north of england who in obedience to the orders of the marquis of newcastle he expected would have marched into scotland but the disinclination of the english to cross the border and the delay of the earl of antrim who was to have landed in the solway frith with his irish army prevented his executing this design other plans having in like manner failed he stated that he found himself under the necessity of assuming a disguise to render his passage secure through the lowlands in which he had been kindly assisted by his kinsman of menteith by what means allan macaulay had come to know him he could not pretend to explain those who knew allan's prophetic pretensions smiled mysteriously but he himself only replied that the earl of montrose need not be surprised if he was known to thousands of whom he himself could retain no memory by the honour of a cavalier said captain dalgetty finding at length an opportunity to thrust in his word i am proud and happy in having an opportunity of drawing a sword under your lordship's command and i do forgive all grudge malcontent and malice of my heart to mr allan macaulay for having thrust me down to the lowest seat of the board yestreen certes he hath this day spoken so like a man having full command of his senses that i had resolved in my secret purpose that he was no way entitled to claim the privilege of insanity but since i was only postponed to a noble earl my future commander-in-chief i do before you all recognize the justice of the preference and heartily salute allan as one who is to be his bon camarado having made this speech which was little understood or attended to without putting off his military glove he seized on allan's hand and began to shake it with violence which allan with a grip like a smith's vice returned with such force as to drive the iron splints of the gauntlet into the hands of the wearer captain dalgetty might have construed this into a new affront had not his attention as he stood blowing and shaking the injured member been suddenly called by montrose himself hear this news he said captain dalgetty i should say major dalgetty the irish who are to profit by your military experience are now within a few leagues of us our deerstalkers said angus macaulay who were abroad to bring in venison for this honourable party have heard of a band of strangers speaking neither saxon nor pure gaelic and with difficulty making themselves understood by the people of the country who are marching this way in arms under the leading it is said of alister macdonald who is commonly called young colquito these must be our men said montrose we must hasten to send messengers forward both to act as guides and to relieve their wants the last said angus macaulay will be no easy matter for i am informed that excepting muskets and a very little ammunition they want everything that soldiers should have and they are particularly deficient in money in shoes and in raiment there is at least no use in saying so said montrose in so loud a tone 
the puritan weavers of glasgow shall provide them plenty of broadcloth when we make a descent from the highlands and if the ministers could formerly preach the old women of the scottish boroughs out of their webs of napery to make tents to the fellows on dun's law the covenanters encamped on dun's law during the troubles of sixteen thirty nine i will try whether i have not a little interest both to make these godly dames renew their patriotic gift and the prick-eared knaves their husbands open their purses and respecting arms said captain dalgetty if your lordship will permit an old cavalier to speak his mind so that the one-third have muskets my darling weapon would be the pike for the remainder whether for resisting a charge of horse or for breaking the infantry a common smith will make a hundred pike-heads in a day here is plenty of wood for shafts and i will uphold that according to the best usages of war a strong battalion of pikes drawn up in the fashion of the lion of the north the immortal gustavus would beat the macedonian phalanx of which i used to read in the marischal college when i studied in the ancient town of bonacord and further i will venture to predicate the captain's lecture upon tactics was here suddenly interrupted by allan m'aulay who said hastily room for an unexpected and unwelcome guest at the same moment the door of the hall opened and a grey-haired man a very stately appearance presented himself to the assembly there was much dignity and even authority in his manner his stature was above the common size and his looks such as were used to command he cast a severe and almost stern glance upon the assembly of chiefs those of the higher rank among them returned it with scornful indifference but some of the western gentlemen of inferior power looked as if they wished themselves elsewhere to which of this assembly said the stranger am i to address myself as leader or have you not fixed upon the person who is to hold an office at least as perilous as it is honourable address yourself to me sir duncan campbell said montrose stepping forward to you said sir duncan campbell with some scorn yes to me repeated montrose to the earl of montrose if you have forgot him i should now at least said sir duncan campbell have had some difficulty in recognizing him in the disguise of a groom and yet i might have guessed that no evil influence inferior to your lordship's distinguished as one who troubles israel could have collected together this rash assembly of misguided persons i will answer unto you said montrose in the manner of your own puritans i have not troubled israel but thou and thy father's house but let us leave an altercation which is of little consequence but to ourselves and hear the tidings you have brought from your chief of argyle for i must conclude that it is in his name that you have come to this meeting it is in the name of the marquis of argyle said sir duncan campbell in the name of the scottish convention of estates that i demand to know the meaning of this singular convocation if it is designed to disturb the peace of the country it were but acting like neighbours and men of honour to give us some intimation to stand upon our guard it is a singular and new state of affairs in scotland said montrose turning from sir duncan campbell to the assembly when scottish men of rank and family cannot meet in the house of a common friend without an inquisitorial visit and demand on the part of our rulers to know the subject of our conference methinks our ancestors were accustomed to hold highland huntings or other purposes of meeting without asking the leave either of the great macallum moore himself or any of his emissaries or dependents the times have been such in scotland answered one of the western chiefs and such they will be again when the intruders on our ancient possessions are again reduced to be lairds of Laco, instead of overspreading us like a band of devouring locusts am i to understand then said sir duncan 
that it is against my name alone that these preparations are directed or are the race of diarmid only to be sufferers in common with the whole of the peaceful and orderly inhabitants of scotland i would ask said a wild-looking chief starting hastily up one question of the knight of ardenvor ere he proceeds farther in his daring catechism has he brought more than one life to this castle that he ventures to intrude among us for the purposes of insult gentlemen said montrose let me implore your patience a messenger who comes among us for the purpose of embassy is entitled to freedom of speech and safe conduct and since sir duncan campbell is so pressing i care not if i inform him for his guidance that he is in an assembly of the king's loyal subjects convoked by me in his majesty's name and authority and as empowered by his majesty's royal commission we are to have then i presume said sir duncan campbell a civil war in all its forms i have been too long a soldier to view its approach with anxiety but it would have been for my lord of montrose's honour if in this matter he had consulted his own ambition less and the peace of the country more those consulted their own ambition and self-interest sir duncan answered montrose who brought the country to the pass in which it now stands and rendered necessary the sharp remedies which we are now reluctantly about to use and what rank among these self-seekers said sir duncan campbell we shall assign to a noble earl so violently attached to the covenant that he was the first in sixteen thirty nine to cross the tyne wading middle deep at the head of his regiment to charge the royal forces it was the same i think who imposed the covenant upon the burgesses and colleges of aberdeen at the point of sword and pike i understand your sneer sir duncan said montrose temperately and i can only add that if sincere repentance can make amends for youthful error and for yielding to the artful representation of ambitious hypocrites i shall be pardoned for the crimes with which you taunt me i will at least endeavour to deserve forgiveness for i am here with my sword in my hand willing to spend the best blood of my body to make amends for my error and mortal men can do no more well my lord said sir duncan i shall be sorry to carry back this language to the marquis of argyle i had it in farther charge from the marquis that to prevent the bloody feuds which must necessarily follow a highland war his lordship will be contented if terms of truce could be arranged to the north of the highland line as there is ground enough in scotland to fight upon without neighbours destroying each other's families and inheritances it is a peaceful proposal said montrose smiling such as it should be coming from one whose personal actions have always been more peaceful than his measures yet if the terms of such a truce could be equally fixed and if we can obtain security for that sir duncan is indispensable that your marquis will observe these terms with strict fidelity i for my part should be content to leave peace behind us since we must needs carry war before us but sir duncan you are too old and experienced a soldier for us to permit you to remain in our leaguer and witness our proceedings we shall therefore when you have refreshed yourself recommend your speedy return to inverary and we shall send with you a gentleman on our part to adjust the terms of the highland armistice in case the marquis shall be found serious in proposing such a measure sir duncan campbell assented by a bow my lord of menteith continued montrose will you have the goodness to attend sir duncan campbell of ardenvor while we determine who shall return with him to his chief macaulay will permit us to request that he be entertained with suitable hospitality i will give orders for that said ellen macaulay rising and coming forward i love sir duncan campbell 
we have been joint sufferers in former days and i do not forget it now my lord of menteith said sir duncan campbell i am grieved to see you at your early age engaged in such desperate and rebellious courses i am young answered menteith yet old enough to distinguish between right and wrong between loyalty and rebellion and the sooner a good course is begun the longer and the better have i a chance of running it and you too my friend allan m'aulay said sir duncan taking his hand must we also call each other enemies that have been so often allied against a common foe then turning round to the meeting he said farewell gentlemen there are so many of you to whom i wish well that your rejection of all terms of mediation gives me deep affliction may heaven he said looking upwards judge between our motives and those of the movers of this civil commotion amen said montrose to that tribunal we all submit us sir duncan campbell left the hall accompanied by allan m'aulay and lord menteith there goes a true-bred campbell said montrose as the envoy departed for they are ever fair and false pardon me my lord said evan dhu hereditary enemy as i am to their name i have ever found the knight of ardenvor brave in war honest in peace and true in counsel of his own disposition said montrose such he is undoubtedly but he now acts as the organ or mouthpiece of his chief the marquis the falsest man that ever drew breath and m'aulay he continued in a whisper to his host lest he should make some impression upon the inexperience of menteith or the singular disposition of your brother you had better send music into their chamber to prevent his inveigling them into any private conference the devil a musician have i answered m'aulay excepting the piper who has nearly broke his wind by an ambitious contention for superiority with three of his own craft but i can send anna lyle with her harp and he left the apartment to give orders accordingly meanwhile a warm discussion took place who should undertake the perilous task of returning with sir duncan to inverary to the higher dignitaries accustomed to consider themselves upon an equality even with m'callum more this was an office not to be proposed unto others who could not plead the same excuse it was altogether unacceptable one would have thought inverary had been the valley of the shadow of death the inferior chiefs showed such reluctance to approach it after a considerable hesitation the plain reason was at length spoken out namely that whatever highlander should undertake an office so distasteful to m'callum more he would be sure to treasure the offence in his remembrance and one day or other to make him bitterly repent of it in this dilemma montrose who considered the proposed armistice as a mere stratagem on the part of argyle although he had not ventured bluntly to reject it in presence of those whom it concerned so nearly resolved to impose the danger and dignity upon captain dalgetty who had neither clan nor estate in the highlands upon which the wrath of argyle could wreak itself but i have a neck though said dalgetty bluntly and what if he chooses to avenge himself upon that i have known a case where an honourable ambassador has been hanged as a spy before now neither did the romans use ambassadors much more mercifully at the siege of capua although i read that they only cut off their hands and noses put out their eyes and suffered them to depart in peace by my honour captain dalgetty said montrose should the marquis contrary to the rules of war dare to practise any atrocity against you you may depend upon my taking such signal vengeance that all scotland shall ring of it that will do but little for dalgetty returned the captain but correggio as the spaniard says with the land of promise full in view the moor of drumthwacket mia papera regna 
as we said at Marischal College, I will not refuse your excellency's commission. Being conscious, it becomes a cavalier of honor to obey his commander's orders, in defiance both of gibbet and sword. Gallantly resolved, said Montrose, and if you will come apart with me, I will furnish you with the conditions to be laid before Macallum Moore, upon which we are willing to grant him a truce for his highland dominions. With these we need not trouble our readers. They were of an evasive nature, calculated to meet a proposal which Montrose considered to have been made only for the purpose of gaining time. When he had put Captain Dalgetty in complete possession of his instructions, and when that worthy, making his military obeisance, was near the door of his apartment, Montrose made him a sign to return. "'I presume,' said he, "'I need not remind an officer who has served under the great Gustavus that a little more is required of a person sent with a flag of truce than mere discharge of his instructions, and that his general will expect from him, on his return, some account of the state of the enemy's affairs, as far as they come under his observation. In short, Captain Dalgetty, you must be un peu clairvoyant. Aha, your excellency, said the captain, twisting his hard features into an inimitable expression of cunning and intelligence, if they do not put my head in a poke, which I have known practised upon honourable soldados who have been suspected to come upon such errands as the present, your excellency may rely on a precise narration of whatever Dugal Dalgetty shall hear or see, were it even how many turns of tune there are in Macallum Moore's pibroke, or how many checks in the set of his plaid and trues. Enough, answered Montrose. Farewell, Captain Dalgetty, and as they say that a lady's mind is always expressed in her postscripts, so I would have you think that the most important part of your commission lies in what I have last said to you. Dalgetty once more grinned intelligence, and withdrew to victual his charger and himself for the fatigues of his approaching mission. At the door of the stable, for Gustavus always claimed his first care, he met Angus Macaulay and Sir Miles Musgrave, who had been looking at his horse, and after praising his points and carriage, both united in strongly dissuading the captain from taking an animal of such value with him upon his present very fatiguing journey. Angus painted in the most alarming colours the roads, or rather wild tracks, by which it would be necessary for him to travel into Argyleshire, and the wretched huts or bothies where he would be condemned to pass the night, and where no forage could be procured for his horse, unless he could eat the stumps of old heather. In short, he pronounced it absolutely impossible that, after undertaking such a pilgrimage, the animal could be in any case for military service. The Englishman strongly confirmed all that angus had said and gave himself body and soul to the devil if he thought it was not an act little short of absolute murder to carry a horse worth a farthing into such a waste and inhospitable desert captain dalgetty for an instant looked steadily first at one of the gentlemen and next at the other and then asked them as if in a state of indecision what they would advise him to do with gustavus under such circumstances by the hand of my father my dear friend answered macaulay if you leave the beast in my keeping you may rely on his being fed and sorted according to his worth and quality and that upon your happy return you will find him as sleek as an onion boiled in butter or said mr miles musgrave if this worthy cavalier chooses to part with his charger for a reasonable sum i have some part of the silver candlesticks still dancing the haze in my purse which i shall be very willing to transfer to his in brief mine honourable friends said captain dalgetty again eyeing them both with an air of comic penetration i find it would not be altogether unacceptable to either of you to have some token to remember the old soldier by in case it shall please 
macallum more to hang him up at the gate of his own castle and doubtless it would be no small satisfaction to me in such an event that a noble and loyal cavalier like sir miles musgrave or a worthy and hospitable chieftain like our excellent landlord should act as my executor both hastened to protest that they had no such object and insisted again upon the impassable character of the highland paths angus macaulay mumbled over a number of hard gaelic names descriptive of the difficult passes precipices corries and beals through which he said the road lay to inverary when old donald who had now entered sanctioned his master's account of these difficulties by holding up his hands and elevating his eyes and shaking his head at every guttural which macaulay pronounced but all this did not move the inflexible captain my worthy friends said he gustavus is not new to the dangers of travelling and the mountains of bohemia and no disparagement to the beals and corries mr angus is pleased to mention and of which sir miles who never saw them confirms the horrors these mountains may compete with the vilest roads in europe in fact my horse hath a most excellent and social quality for although he cannot pledge in my cup yet we share our loaf between us and it will be hard if he suffers famine where cakes or bannocks are to be found and to cut this matter short i beseech you my good friends to observe the state of sir duncan campbell's palfrey which stands in that stall before us fat and fair and in return for your anxiety on my account i give you my honest asseveration that while we travel the same road both that palfrey and his rider shall lack for food before either gustavus or i having said this he filled a large measure with corn and walked up with it to his charger who by his low whinnying neigh his pricked ears and his pawing showed how close the alliance was betwixt him and his rider nor did he taste his corn until he had returned his master's caresses by licking his hands and face after this interchange of greeting the steed began to his provender with an eager dispatch which showed old military habits and the master after looking on the animal with great complacency for about five minutes said much good may it do your honest heart gustavus now may i go and lay in provant myself for the campaign he then departed having first saluted the englishman and angus macaulay who remained looking at each other for some time in silence and then burst out into a fit of laughter that fellow said sir miles musgrave is formed to go through the world i shall think so too said macaulay if he can slip through macallum moore's fingers as easily as he has done through ours do you think said the englishman that the marquis will not respect in captain dalgetty's person the laws of civilized war no more than i would respect a lowland proclamation said angus macaulay but come along it is time i were returning to my guests End of chapter eight chapter nine of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter nine in a rebellion when what's not meet but what must be was law then were they chosen in a better hour let what is meet be said it must be meet and throw their power in the dust coriolanus in a small apartment remote from the rest of the guests assembled at the castle sir duncan campbell was presented with every species of refreshment and respectfully attended by lord menteith and by alan macaulay his discourse with the latter turned upon a sort of hunting campaign in which they had been engaged together against the children of the mist 
with whom the knight of ardenvor as well as the macaulays had a deadly and irreconcilable feud sir duncan however speedily endeavoured to lead back the conversation to the subject of his present errand to the castle of darnlinvarach it grieved him to the very heart he said to see that friends and neighbours who should stand shoulder to shoulder were likely to be engaged hand to hand in a cause which so little concerned them what signifies it he said to the highland chiefs whether king or parliament got uppermost were it not better to let them settle their own differences without interference while the chiefs in the meantime took the opportunity of establishing their own authority in a manner not to be called in question hereafter by either king or parliament he reminded allan macaulay that the measures taken in the last reign to settle the peace as was alleged of the highlands were in fact levelled at the patriarchal power of the chieftains and he mentioned the celebrated settlement of the fife undertakers as they were called in the lewis as part of a deliberate plan formed to introduce strangers among the celtic tribes to destroy by degrees their ancient customs and mode of government and to despoil them of the inheritance of their fathers in the reign of james the sixth an attempt of rather an extraordinary kind was made to civilize the extreme northern part of the hebridean archipelago that monarch granted the property of the island of lewis as if it had been an unknown and savage country to a number of lowland gentlemen called undertakers chiefly natives of the shire of fife that they might colonize and settle there the enterprise was at first successful but the natives of the island macleods and mackenzies rose on the lowland adventurers and put most of them to the sword and yet he continued addressing allan it is for the purpose of giving despotic authority to the monarch by whom these designs have been nursed that so many highland chiefs are upon the point of quarrelling with and drawing the sword against their neighbours allies and ancient confederates it is to my brother said allan it is to the eldest son of my father's house that the knight of ardenvor must address these remonstrances i am indeed the brother of angus but in being so i am only the first of his clansmen and bound to show an example to the others by my cheerful and ready obedience to his commands the cause also said lord menteith interposing is far more general than sir duncan campbell seems to suppose it it is neither limited to saxon nor to gael to mountain nor to strath to highlands nor to lowlands the question is if we will continue to be governed by the unlimited authority assumed by a set of persons in no respect superior to ourselves instead of returning to the natural government of the prince against whom they have rebelled and respecting the interest of the highlands in particular he added i crave sir duncan campbell's pardon for my plainness but it seems very clear to me that the only effect produced by the present usurpation will be the aggrandizement of one overgrown clan at the expense of every independent chief in the highlands i will not reply to you my lord said sir duncan campbell because i know your prejudices and from whom they are borrowed yet you will pardon my saying that being at the head of a rival branch of the house of graham i have both read of and known an earl of menteith who would have disdained to have been tutored in politics or to have been commanded in war by an earl of montrose you will find it in vain sir duncan said lord menteith haughtily to set my vanity in arms against my principles the king gave my ancestors their title and rank and these shall never prevent my acting in the royal cause under any one who is better qualified than myself to be a commander-in-chief least of all 
shall any miserable jealousy prevent me from placing my hand and sword under the guidance of the bravest the most loyal the most heroic spirit among our scottish nobility pity said sir duncan campbell that you cannot add to this panegyric the farther epithets of the most steady and the most consistent but i have no purpose of debating these points with you my lord waving his hand as if to avoid farther discussion the die is cast with you allow me only to express my sorrow for the disastrous fate to which angus macaulay's natural rashness and your lordship's influence are dragging my gallant friend allan here with his father's clan and many a brave man besides the die is cast for us all sir duncan replied allan looking gloomy and arguing on his own hypochondriac feelings the iron hand of destiny branded our fate upon our forehead long ere we could form a wish or raise a finger in our own behalf were this otherwise by what means does the seer ascertain the future from those shadowy presages which haunt his waking and his sleeping eye naught can be foreseen but that which is certain to happen sir duncan campbell was about to reply and the darkest and most contested point of metaphysics might have been brought into discussion betwixt two highland disputants when the door opened and annot lyle with her clairshack in her hand entered the apartment the freedom of a highland maiden was in her step and in her eye for bred up in the closest intimacy with the laird of macaulay and his brother with lord menteith and other young men who frequented darnlinvarach she possessed none of that timidity which a female educated chiefly among her own sex would either have felt or thought necessary to assume on an occasion like the present her dress partook of the antique for new fashions seldom penetrated into the highlands nor would they easily have found their way to a castle inhabited chiefly by men whose sole occupation was war and the chase yet annet's garments were not only becoming but even rich her open jacket with a high collar was composed of blue cloth richly embroidered and had silver clasps to fasten when it pleased the wearer its sleeves which were wide came no lower than the elbow and terminated in a golden fringe under this upper coat if it can be so termed she wore an under-dress of blue satin also richly embroidered but which was several shades lighter in colour than the upper garment the petticoat was formed of tartan silk in the set or pattern of which the colour of blue greatly predominated so as to remove the tawdry effect too frequently produced in tartan by the mixture and strong opposition of colours an antique silver chain hung round her neck and supported the rest or key with which she tuned her instrument a small ruff rose above her collar and was secured by a brooch of some value an old keepsake from lord menteith her profusion of light hair almost hid her laughing eyes while with a smile and a blush she mentioned that she had macaulay's directions to ask them if they chose music sir duncan campbell gazed with considerable surprise and interest at the lovely apparition which thus interrupted his debate with allan macaulay can this he said to him in a whisper a creature so beautiful and so elegant be a domestic musician of your brother's establishment by no means answered allan hastily yet with some hesitation she is um, a near relation of our family and treated he added more firmly as an adopted daughter of our father's house as he spoke thus he arose from his seat and with that air of courtesy which every highlander can assume when it suits him to practise it he resigned it to annet and offered to her at the same time whatever refreshments the table afforded with an assiduity which was probably designed to give sir duncan 
and impression of her rank and consequence if such was allan's purpose however it was unnecessary sir duncan kept his eyes fixed upon annot with an expression of much deeper interest than could have arisen from any impression that she was a person of consequence annot even felt embarrassed under the old knight's steady gaze and it was not without considerable hesitation that tuning her instrument and receiving an assenting look from lord menteith and allan she executed the following ballad which our friend mr secundus macpherson whose goodness we had before to acknowledge has thus translated into the english tongue the orphan maid november's hail cloud drifts away november's sunbeam wan looks coldly on the castle grey when forth comes lady anne the orphan by the oak was set her arms her feet were bare the hail drops had not melted yet amid her raven hair and dame she said by all the ties that child and mother know aid one who never knew these joys relieve an orphan's woe the lady said an orphan's state is hard and sad to bear yet worse the widowed mother's fate who mourns both lord and heir twelve times the rolling year has sped since when from vengeance wild of fierce strathallan's chief i fled forth's eddies whelmed my child twelve times the year its course has borne the wandering maid replied since fishers on st bridget's morn drew nets on campsie side st bridget sent no scaly spoil an infant well nigh dead they saved and reared in want and toil to beg from you her bread that orphan maid the lady kissed my husband's looks you bear st bridget and her morn be blessed you are his widow's heir they've robed that maid so poor and pale in silk and sandals rare and pearls for drops of frozen hail are glistening in her hair the admirers of pure celtic antiquity notwithstanding the elegance of the above translation may be desirous to see a literal version from the original gaelic which we therefore subjoin and have only to add that the original is deposited with mr jedediah clashbotham literal translation the hail blast had drifted away upon the wings of the gale of autumn the sun looked from between the clouds pale as the wounded hero who rears his head feebly on the heath when the roar of battle hath passed over him finally the lady of the castle came forth to see her maidens pass to the herds with their leglands milk pails there sat an orphan maiden beneath the old oak tree of appointment the withered leaves fell round her and her heart was more withered than they the parent of the ice poetically taken from the frost still congealed the hail drops in her hair they were like the specks of white ashes on the twisted boughs of the blackened and half-consumed oak that blazes in the hall and the maiden said give me comfort lady i am an orphan child and the lady replied how can i give that which i have not i am the widow of a slain lord the mother of a perished child when i fled in my fear from the vengeance of my husband's foes our bark was overwhelmed in the tide and my infant perished this was on st bridget's morn near the strong lens of campsy may ill luck light upon the day and the maiden answered it was on st bridget's morn and twelve harvests before this time that the fishermen of campsy drew in their nets neither grills nor salmon but an infant half dead who hath since lived in misery and must die unless she is now aided and the lady answered blessed be st bridget and her morn for these are the dark eyes and the falcon look of my slain lord and thine shall be the inheritance of his widow and she called for her waiting attendants and she bade them clothe that maiden in silk and in samite 
and the pearls which they wove among her black tresses were whiter than the frozen hill-drops while the song proceeded lord menteith observed with some surprise that it appeared to produce a much deeper effect upon the mind of sir duncan campbell than he could possibly have anticipated from his age and character he well knew that the highlanders of that period possessed a much greater sensibility both for tale and song than was found among their lowland neighbours but even this he thought hardly accounted for the embarrassment with which the old man withdrew his eyes from the songstress as if unwilling to suffer them to rest on an object so interesting still less was it to be expected that features which expressed pride stern common sense and the austere habit of authority should have been so much agitated by so trivial a circumstance as the chief's brow became clouded he drooped his large shaggy grey eyebrows until they almost concealed his eyes on the lids of which something like a tear might be seen to glisten he remained silent and fixed in the same posture for a minute or two after the last note had ceased to vibrate he then raised his head and having looked at annot lyle as if purposing to speak to her he as suddenly changed that purpose and was about to address allan when the door opened and the lord of the castle made his appearance end of chapter nine chapter ten of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 10. Dark on their journey, Lord the gloomy day. Wild were the hills, and doubtful grew the way. More dark, more gloomy, and more doubtful showed the mansion which received them from the road. The Travellers. A Romance angus macaulay was charged with a message which he seemed to find some difficulty in communicating for it was not till after he had framed his speech several different ways and blundered them all that he succeeded in letting sir duncan campbell know that the cavalier who was to accompany him was waiting in readiness and that all was prepared for his return to inverary sir duncan campbell rose up very indignantly the affront which this message implied immediately driving out of his recollection the sensibility which had been awakened by the music i little expected this he said looking indignantly at angus macaulay i little thought that there was a chief in the west highlands who at the pleasure of a saxon would have bid the knight of ardenvor leave his castle when the sun was declining from the meridian and ere the second cup had been filled but farewell sir the food of a churl does not satisfy the appetite when i next revisit darnlinvarach it shall be with a naked sword in one hand and a firebrand in the other and if you so come said angus i pledge myself to meet you fairly though you brought five hundred campbells at your back and to afford you and them such entertainment that you shall not again complain of the hospitality of darnlinvarach threatened men said sir duncan live long your turn for gasconading laird of macaulay is too well known that men of honour should regard your vaunts to you my lord and to allan who have supplied the place of my churlish host i leave my thanks and to you pretty mistress he said addressing annot lyle this little token for having opened a fountain which hath been dry for many a year so saying he left the apartment and commanded his attendants to be summoned angus macaulay equally embarrassed and incensed at the charge of inhospitality which was the greatest possible affront to a highlander did not follow sir duncan to the courtyard 
where mounting his palfrey which was in readiness followed by six mounted attendants and accompanied by the noble captain dalgetty who had also awaited him holding gustavus ready for action though he did not draw his girths and mount till sir duncan appeared the whole cavalcade left the castle the journey was long and toilsome but without any of the extreme privations which the laird of macaulay had prophesied in truth sir duncan was very cautious to avoid those nearer and more secret paths by means of which the county of argyle was accessible from the eastward for his relation and chief the marquis was used to boast that he would not for a hundred thousand crowns any mortal should know the passes by which an armed force could penetrate into his country sir duncan campbell therefore rather shunned the highlands and falling into the low country made for the nearest seaport in the vicinity where he had several half-decked galleys or burlings as they were called at his command in one of these they embarked with gustavus in company who was so seasoned to adventure that land and sea seemed as indifferent to him as to his master the wind being favourable they pursued their way rapidly with sails and oars and early the next morning it was announced to captain dalgetty then in a small cabin beneath the hull-deck that the galley was under the walls of sir duncan campbell's castle ardenvor accordingly rose high above him when he came upon the deck of the galley it was a gloomy square tower of considerable size and great height situated upon a headland projecting into the salt-water lake or arm of the sea which they had entered on the preceding evening a wall with flanking towers at each angle surrounded the castle to landward but towards the lake it was built so near the brink of the precipice as only to leave room for a battery of seven guns designed to protect the fortress from any insult from that side although situated too high to be of any effectual use according to the modern system of warfare the eastern sun rising behind the old tower flung its shadow far on the lake darkening the deck of the galley on which captain dalgetty now walked waiting with some impatience the signal to land sir duncan campbell as he was informed by his attendants was already within the walls of the castle but no one encouraged the captain's proposal of following him ashore until as they stated they should receive the direct permission or order of the knight of ardenvor in a short time afterwards the mandate arrived while a boat with a piper in the bow bearing the knight of ardenvor's crest in silver upon his left arm and playing with all his might the family march entitled the campbells are coming approached to conduct the envoy of montrose to the castle of ardenvor the distance between the galley and the beach was so short as scarce to require the assistance of the eight sturdy rowers in bonnets short coats and trews whose efforts sent the boat to the little creek in which they usually landed before one could have conceived that it had left the side of the burling two of the boatmen in spite of dalgetty's resistance horsed the captain on the back of a third highlander and wading through the surf with him landed him high and dry upon the beach beneath the castle rock in the face of this rock there appeared something like the entrance of a low-browed cavern towards which the assistants were preparing to hurry our friend dalgetty when shaking himself loose from them with some difficulty he insisted upon seeing gustavus safely landed before he proceeded one step farther the highlanders could not comprehend what he meant until one who had picked up a little english or rather lowland scotch exclaimed howts it's about her horse to useless base farther remonstrance on the part of captain dalgetty was interrupted by the appearance of sir duncan campbell himself from the mouth of the cavern which we have described for the purpose of inviting captain dalgetty 
to accept of the hospitality of Ardenvor, pledging his honour at the same time that Gustavus should be treated as became the hero from whom he derived his name, not to mention the important person to whom he now belonged. Notwithstanding this satisfactory guarantee, Captain Dalgetty would still have hesitated, such was his anxiety to witness the fate of his companion Gustavus, had not two Highlanders seized him by the arms, two more pushed him on behind, while a fifth exclaimed, How awa with the daft Sassenach! Does she no hear the laird bidden her up to Ain Castle with her special voice, and isn't that very mickle honour for the like o' her? Thus impelled, Captain Dalgetty could only for a short space keep a reverted eye towards the galley in which he had left the partner of his military toils. In a few minutes afterwards he found himself involved in the total darkness of a staircase, which, entering from the low-browed cavern we have mentioned, winded upwards through the entrails of the living rock. "'The cursed highland salvages!' muttered the captain half aloud. "'What is to become of me, if Gustavus, the namesake of the invincible lion of the Protestant League, should be lamed among their untenty hands?' "'Have no fear of that,' said the voice of Sir Duncan, who was nearer to him than he imagined. "'My men are accustomed to handle horses, both in embarking and dressing them, and you will soon see Gustavus as safe as when you last dismounted from his back.' Captain Dalgetty knew the world too well to offer any farther remonstrance, whatever uneasiness he might suppress within his own bosom. A step or two higher up the stair showed light and a door and an iron grated wicket led him out upon a gallery cut in the open face of the rock extending a space of about six or eight yards until he reached a second door where the path re-entered the rock and which was also defended by an iron portcullis an admirable traverse observed the captain and if commanded by a field-piece or even a few muskets quite sufficient to ensure the place against a storming party sir duncan campbell made no answer at the time but the moment afterwards when they had entered the second cavern he struck with the stick which he had in his hand first on the one side and then on the other of the wicket and the sullen ringing sound which replied to the blows, made Captain Dalgetty sensible that there was a gun placed on each side, for the purpose of raking the gallery through which they had passed, although the embrasures, through which they might be fired on occasion, were masked on the outside with sods and loose stones. Having ascended the second staircase, they found themselves again on an open platform and gallery, exposed to a fire both of musketry and wall-guns if being come with hostile intent they had ventured farther a third flight of steps cut in the rock like the former but not caverned over led them finally into the battery at the foot of the tower this last stair also was narrow and steep and not to mention the fire which might be directed on it from above one or two resolute men with pikes and battle-axes, could have made the pass good against hundreds, for the staircase would not admit two persons abreast, and was not secured by any sort of balustrade or railing from the sheer and abrupt precipice on the foot of which the tide now rolled with a voice of thunder, so that, under the jealous precautions used to secure this ancient Celtic fortress, a person of weak nerves and a brain liable to become dizzy might have found it something difficult to have achieved the entrance to the castle even supposing no resistance had been offered captain dalgetty too old a soldier to feel such tremors had no sooner arrived in the courtyard than he protested to god the defences of sir duncan's castle reminded him more of the notable fortress of spandau situated in the march of brandenburg than of any place whilk it had been his fortune to defend in the course of his travels. 
nevertheless he criticized considerably the mode of placing the guns on the battery we have noticed observing that where cannon were perched like the scarts or seagulls on the top of a rock he had ever observed that they astonished more by their noise than they dismayed by the scathe or damage which they occasioned sir duncan without replying conducted the soldier into the tower the defences of which were a portcullis an iron clenched oaken door the thickness of the wall being the space between them he had no sooner arrived in a hall hung with tapestry than the captain prosecuted his military criticism it was indeed suspended by the sight of an excellent breakfast of which he partook with great avidity but no sooner had he secured this meal than he made the tour of the apartment examining the ground around the castle very carefully from each window in the room he then returned to his chair and throwing himself back into it at his length stretched out one manly leg and tapping his jack-boot with the riding-rod which he carried in his hand after the manner of a half-bred man who affects ease in the society of his betters he delivered his unasked opinion as follows this house of yours now sir duncan is a very pretty defensible sort of a tenement and yet it is hardly such as a cavaliero of honour would expect to maintain his credit by holding out for many days for sir duncan if it pleases you to notice your house is overcrowed and slighted or commanded as we military men say by yonder round hillock to the landward whereon an enemy might stell such a battery of cannon as would make ye glad to beat a chamade within forty-eight hours unless it pleased the lord extraordinarily to show mercy there is no road replied sir duncan somewhat shortly by which cannon can be brought against ardenvor the swamps and morasses around my house would scarce carry your horse and yourself excepting by such paths as could be rendered impassable within a few hours sir duncan said the captain it is your pleasure to suppose so and yet we martial men say that where there is a sea-coast there is always a naked side seeing that cannon and munition where they cannot be transported by land may be right easily brought by sea near to the place where they are to be put in action neither is a castle however secure in its situation to be accounted altogether invincible or as they say impregnable for i protest to ye sir duncan that i have known twenty-five men by the mere surprise and audacity of the attack when at point of pike as strong a hold as this of ardenvor and put to the sword captivate or hold to the ransom the defenders being ten times their own number notwithstanding sir duncan campbell's knowledge of the world and his power of concealing his internal emotion he appeared piqued and hurt at these reflections which the captain made with the most unconscious gravity having merely selected the subject of conversation as one upon which he thought himself capable of shining and as they say of laying down the law without exactly recollecting that the topic might not be equally agreeable to his landlord to cut this matter short said sir duncan with an expression of voice and countenance somewhat agitated it is unnecessary for you to tell me captain dalgetty that a castle may be stormed if it is not valorously defended or surprised if it is not heedfully watched i trust this poor house of mine will not be found in any of these predicaments should even captain dalgetty himself choose to beleaguer it for all that sir duncan answered the persevering commander i would premonish you as a friend to trace out a sconce upon that round hill with a good graph or ditch whilk may be easily accomplished by compelling the labour of the boars in the vicinity it being the custom of the valorous gustavus adolphus to fight as much by the spade and shovel as by sword pike and musket 
also i would advise you to fortify the said sconce not only by a fusi or graf but also by certain stackets or palisades here sir duncan becoming impatient left the apartment the captain following him to the door and raising his voice as he retreated until he was fairly out of hearing the whelk stackets or palisades should be artificially framed with re-entering angles and loopholes or crenelles for musketry whereof it shall arise that the foeman the highland brute the old highland brute they are as proud as peacocks and as obstinate as tups and here he has missed an opportunity of making his house as pretty an irregular fortification as an invading army ever broke their teeth upon but i see he continued looking down from the window upon the bottom of the precipice they have got gustavus safe ashore proper fellow i would know that toss of his head among a whole squadron i must go to see what they are to make of him he had no sooner reached however the court to the seaward and put himself in the act of descending the staircase than two highland sentinels advancing their lockaber axes gave him to understand that this was a service of danger diavolo said the soldier and i have got no password i could not speak a syllable of their savage gibberish and it were to save me from the provost marshal i will be your surety captain dalgetty said sir duncan who had again approached him without his observing from whence and we will go together and see how your favourite charger is accommodated he conducted him accordingly down the staircase to the beach and from thence by a short turn behind a large rock which concealed the stables and other offices belonging to the castle captain dalgetty became sensible at the same time that the side of the castle to the land was rendered totally inaccessible by a ravine partly natural and partly scarped with great care and labour so as to be only passed by a drawbridge still however the captain insisted notwithstanding the triumphant air with which sir duncan pointed out his defences that a sconce should be erected on drumsnab the round eminence to the east of the castle in respect the house might be annoyed from thence by burning buckets full of fire shot out of cannon according to the curious invention of stephen bathian king of poland whereby that prince utterly ruined the great muscovite city of moscow this invention captain dalgetty owned he had not yet witnessed but observed that it would give him particular delectation to witness the same put to the proof against ardenvor or any other castle of similar strength observing that so curious an experiment could not but afford the greatest delight to all admirers of the military art sir duncan campbell diverted this conversation by carrying the soldier into his stables and suffering him to arrange gustavus according to his own will and pleasure after this duty had been carefully performed captain dalgetty proposed to return to the castle observing it was his intention to spend the time betwixt this and dinner which he presumed would come upon the parade about noon in burnishing his armour which having sustained some injury from the sea air might he was afraid seem discreditable in the eyes of Macallum moore yet while they were returning to the castle he failed not to warn sir duncan campbell against the great injury he might sustain by any sudden onfall of an enemy whereby his horses cattle and granaries might be cut off and consumed to his great prejudice wherefore he again strongly conjured him to construct a sconce upon the round hill called drumsnab and offered his own friendly services in lining out the same to this disinterested advice sir duncan only replied by ushering his guest to his apartment and informing him that the tolling of the castle bell would make him aware when dinner was ready end of chapter ten
Chapter Eleven of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Eleven. Is this thy castle, Baldwin? melancholy displays her sable banner from the donjon darkening the foam of the whole surge beneath were i a habitant to see this gloom pollute the face of nature and to hear the ceaseless sound of wave and seabird scream i'd wish me in the hut that poorest peasant e'er framed to give him temporary shelter Brown. The gallant Rittmaster would willingly have employed his leisure in studying the exterior of Sir Duncan's castle, and verifying his own military ideas upon the nature of its defences. But a stout sentinel, who mounted guard with a lockaber axe at the door of his apartment, gave him to understand, by very significant signs, that he was in a sort of honourable captivity. It is strange, thought the Rittmaster to himself, how well these savages understand the rules and practique of war. Who should have presupposed their acquaintance with the maxim of the great and godlike Gustavus Adolphus, that a flag of truce should be half a messenger, half a spy? and having finished burnishing his arms he sat down patiently to compute how much half a dollar per diem would amount to at the end of a six months campaign and when he had settled that problem proceeded to the more abstruse calculations necessary for drawing up a brigade of two thousand men on the principle of extracting the square root from his musings he was roused by the joyful sound of the dinner-bell on which the highlander lately his guard became his gentleman usher and marshalled him to the hall where a table with four covers bore ample proofs of highland hospitality sir duncan entered conducting his lady a tall faded melancholy female dressed in deep mourning they were followed by a presbyterian clergyman in his geneva cloak and wearing a black silk skull-cap covering his short hair so closely that it could scarcely be seen at all so that the unrestricted ears had an undue predominance in the general aspect this ungraceful fashion was universal at the time and partly led to the nicknames of roundheads prick-eared curs and so forth which the insolence of the cavaliers liberally bestowed on their political enemies sir duncan presented his military guest to his lady who received his technical salutation with a stiff and silent reverence in which it could scarce be judged whether pride or melancholy had the greater share the churchman to whom he was next presented eyed him with a glance of mingled dislike and curiosity the captain well accustomed to worse looks from more dangerous persons cared very little either for those of the lady or of the divine but bent his whole soul upon assaulting a huge piece of beef which smoked at the nether end of the table but the onslaught as he would have termed it was delayed until the conclusion of a very long grace betwixt every section of which dalgetty handled his knife and fork as he might have done his musket or pike when going upon action and as often resigned them unwillingly when the prolix chaplain commenced another clause of his benediction sir duncan listened with decency though he was supposed rather to have joined the covenanters out of devotion to his chief than real respect for the cause either of liberty or of presbytery his lady alone attended to the blessing with symptoms of deep acquiescence 
the meal was performed almost in carthusian silence for it was none of captain dalgetty's habits to employ his mouth in talking while it could be more profitably occupied sir duncan was absolutely silent and the lady and churchman only occasionally exchanged a few words spoken low and indistinctly but when the dishes were removed and their place supplied by liquors of various sorts captain dalgetty no longer had himself the same weighty reasons for silence and began to tire of that of the rest of the company he commenced a new attack upon his landlord upon the former ground touching that round monticle or hill or eminence termed drumsnap i would be proud to hold some dialogue with you sir duncan on the nature of the sconce to be there constructed and whether the angles thereof should be acute or obtuse and nant whelk i have heard the great velk marischal banier hold a learned argument with general tiefenbach during a still stand of arms captain dalgetty answered sir duncan very dryly it is not our highland usage to debate military points with strangers this castle is like to hold out against a stronger enemy than any force which the unfortunate gentlemen we left at darnlinvarach are able to bring against it a deep sigh from the lady accompanied the conclusion of her husband's speech which seemed to remind her of some painful circumstance he who gave said the clergyman addressing her in a solemn tone hath taken away may you honourable lady be long enabled to say blessed be his name to this exhortation which seemed intended for her sole behoof the lady answered by an inclination of her head more humble than captain dalgetty had yet observed her make supposing he should now find her in a more conversable humour he proceeded to accost her it is indubitably very natural that your ladyship should be downcast at the mention of military preparations whilk i have observed to spread perturbation among women of all nations and almost all conditions nevertheless penthesilea in ancient times and also joan of arc and others were of a different kidney and as i have learned while i served the spaniard the duke of alva in former times had the leaguer lasses who followed his camp marshalled into tertias whilk me call regiments and officered and commanded by those of their own feminine gender and regulated by a commander-in-chief called in german hurwebler or as we would say vernacularly captain of the queens true it is they were persons not to be named as parallel to your ladyship being such quae questum corporbius faciabant as we said of jean drochiels at marshall college the same whom the french term courtesans and we in scottish the lady will spare you the trouble of further exposition captain dalgetty said his host somewhat sternly to which the clergyman added that such discourse better befitted a watch-tower guarded by profane soldiery than the board of an honourable person and the presence of a lady of quality craving your pardon domine or doctor at quo conque alio nomine godes for i would have you to know i have studied polite letters said the unabashed envoy filling a great cup of wine i see no ground for your reproof seeing i did not speak of those turpes personae as if their occupation or character was a proper subject of conversation for this lady's presence but simply par accidens as illustrating the matter in hand namely their natural courage and audacity much enhanced doubtless by the desperate circumstances of their condition captain dalgetty said sir duncan campbell to break short this discourse 
i must acquaint you that i have some business to dispatch to-night in order to enable me to ride with you to-morrow towards inverary and therefore to ride with this person to-morrow exclaimed his lady such cannot be your purpose sir duncan unless you have forgotten that the morrow is a sad anniversary and dedicated to as sad a solemnity i had not forgotten answered sir duncan how is it possible i can ever forget but the necessity of these times requires i should send this officer onward to inverary without loss of time yet surely not that you should accompany him in person inquired the lady it were better i did said sir duncan yet i can write to the marquis and follow on the subsequent day captain dalgetty i will dispatch a letter for you explaining to the marquis of argyle your character and commission with which you will please to prepare to travel to inverary early to-morrow morning sir duncan campbell said dalgetty i am doubtless at your discretionary disposal in this matter not the less i pray you to remember the blot which will fall upon your own escutcheon if you do in any way suffer me being a commissionate flag of truce to be circumvented in this matter whether clam v vel precario i do not say by your assent to any wrong done to me but even through absence of any due care on your part to prevent the same you are under the safeguard of my honour sir answered sir duncan campbell and that is more than a sufficient security and now continued he rising i must set the example of retiring dalgetty saw himself under the necessity of following the hint though the hour was early but like a skilful general he availed himself of every instant of delay which circumstances permitted trusting to your honourable parole said he filling his cup i drink to you sir duncan and to the continuance of your honourable house a sigh from sir duncan was the only reply also madame said the soldier replenishing the quaff with all possible dispatch i drink to your honourable health and fulfilment of all your virtuous desires and reverend sir not forgetting to fit the action to the words i fill this cup to the drowning of all unkindness betwixt you and captain dalgetty i should say major and in respect the flagon contains but one cup more i drink to the health of all honourable cavaliers and brave soldados and the flask being empty i am ready sir duncan to attend your functionary or sentinel to my place of private repose he received a formal permission to retire and an assurance that as the wine seemed to be to his taste another measure of the same vintage should attend him presently in order to soothe the hours of his solitude no sooner had the captain reached the apartment than this promise was fulfilled and in a short time afterwards the added comforts of a pasty of red deer venison rendered him very tolerant both of confinement and want of society the same domestic a sort of chamberlain who placed this good cheer in his apartment delivered to dalgetty a packet sealed and tied up with a silken thread according to the custom of the time addressed with many forms of respect to the high and mighty prince archibald marquis of argyle lord of lorne and so forth the chamberlain at the same time apprised the ritmaster that he must take horse at an early hour for inverary where the packet of sir duncan would be at once his introduction and his passport not forgetting that it was his object to collect information as well as to act as an envoy and desirous for his own sake to ascertain sir duncan's reasons for sending him onward without his personal attendance the ritmaster inquired the domestic with all the precaution that his experience suggested 
what were the reasons which detained sir duncan at home on the succeeding day the man who was from the lowlands replied that it was the habit of sir duncan and his lady to observe as a day of solemn fast and humiliation the anniversary on which their castle had been taken by surprise and their children to the number of four destroyed cruelly by a band of highland freebooters during sir duncan's absence upon an expedition which the marquis of argyle had undertaken against the maclean's of the isle of mull truly said the soldier your lord and lady have some cause for fast and humiliation nevertheless i will venture to pronounce that if he had taken the advice of any experienced soldier having skill in the practiques of defending places of advantage he would have built a sconce upon the small hill which is to the left of the drawbrig and this i can easily prove to you mine honest friend for holding that pasty to be the castle what's your name friend lorimer sir replied the man here is to your health honest lorimer i say lorimer holding that pasty to be the main body or citadel of the place to be defended and taking the marrow-bone for the sconce to be erected i am sorry sir said lorimer interrupting him that i cannot stay to hear the rest of your demonstration but the bell will presently ring as worthy mr graniengal the marquis's own chaplain does family worship and only seven of our household out of sixty persons understand the scottish tongue it would misbecome any one of them to be absent and greatly prejudice me in the opinion of my lady there are pipes and tobacco sir if you please to drink a whiff of smoke and if you want anything else it shall be forthcoming two hours hence when prayers are over so saying he left the apartment no sooner was he gone than the heavy toll of the castle bell summoned its inhabitants together and was answered by the shrill clamour of the females mixed with the deeper tones of the men as talking erse at the top of their throats they hurried from different quarters by a long but narrow gallery which served as a communication to many rooms and among others to that in which captain dalgetty was stationed there they go as if they were beating to the roll-call thought the soldier to himself if they all attend the parade i will look out take a mouthful of fresh air and make mine own observations on the practicabilities of this place accordingly when all was quiet he opened his chamber door and prepared to leave it when he saw his friend with the axe advancing towards him from the distant end of the gallery half whistling a gaelic tune to have shown any want of confidence would have been at once impolitic and unbecoming his military character so the captain putting the best face upon his situation he could whistled a swedish retreat in a tone still louder than the notes of his sentinel and retreating pace by pace with an air of indifference as if his only purpose had been to breathe a little fresh air he shut the door in the face of his guard when the fellow had approached within a few paces of him it is very well thought the ritmaster to himself he annuls my parole by putting guards upon me for as we used to say at marischal college fidus et fiducia sunt relativa and if he does not trust my word i do not see how i am bound to keep it if any motive should occur for my desiring to depart from it surely the moral obligation of the parole is relaxed in as far as physical force is substituted instead thereof thus comforting himself in the metaphysical immunities which he deduced from the vigilance of his sentinel ritmaster dalgetty retired to his apartment where amid the theoretical calculations of tactics and the occasional more practical attacks on the flask and pasty 
he consumed the evening until it was time to go to repose he was summoned by lorimer at break of day who gave him to understand that when he had broken his fast for which he produced ample materials his guide and horse were in attendance for his journey to inverary after complying with the hospitable hint of the chamberlain the soldier proceeded to take horse in passing through the apartments he observed that domestics were busily employed in hanging the great hall with black cloth a ceremony which he said he had seen practised when the immortal gustavus adolphus lay in state in the castle of walgast and which therefore he opined was a testimonial of the strictest and deepest mourning when dalgetty mounted his steed he found himself attended or perhaps guarded by five or six campbells well armed commanded by one who from the target at his shoulder and the short cock's feather in his bonnet as well as from the state which he took upon himself claimed the rank of a dunniewassel or clansman of superior rank and indeed from his dignity of deportment could not stand in a more distant degree of relationship to sir duncan than that of tenth or twelfth cousin at farthest but it was impossible to extract positive information on this or any other subject inasmuch as neither this commander nor any of his party spoke english the captain rode and his military attendants walked but such was their activity and so numerous the impediments which the nature of the road presented to the equestrian mode of travelling that far from being retarded by the slowness of their pace his difficulty was rather in keeping up with his guides he observed that they occasionally watched him with a sharp eye as if they were jealous of some effort to escape and once as he lingered behind at crossing a brook one of the gillies began to blow the match of his piece giving him to understand that he would run some risk in case of an attempt to part company dalgetty did not augur much good from the close watch thus maintained upon his person but there was no remedy for an attempt to escape from his attendants in an impervious and unknown country would have been little short of insanity he therefore plodded patiently on through a waste and savage wilderness treading paths which were only known to the shepherds and cattle drivers and passing with much more of discomfort than satisfaction many of those sublime combinations of mountainous scenery which now draw visitors from every corner of england to feast their eyes upon highland grandeur and mortify their palates upon highland fare at length they arrived on the southern verge of that noble lake upon which inverary is situated and a bugle which the dunny wassel winded till rock and greenwood rang served as a signal to a well-manned galley which started from a creek where it lay concealed received the party on board including gustavus which sagacious quadruped and experienced traveller both by water and land walked in and out of the boat with the discretion of a christian embarked on the bosom of loch fine captain dalgetty might have admired one of the grandest scenes which nature affords he might have noticed the rival rivers of array and Chiray, which pay tribute to the lake each issuing from its own dark and wooded retreat he might have marked on the soft and gentle slope that ascends from the shores the noble old gothic castle with its varied outline embattled walls towers and outer and inner courts which so far as the picturesque is concerned presented an aspect much more striking than the present massive and uniform mansion he might have admired those dark woods which for many a mile surrounded this strong and princely dwelling and his eye might have dwelt on the picturesque peak of dunaqua starting abruptly from the lake and raising its scathed brow into the mists of middle sky while a solitary watch-tower 
perched on its top like an eagle's nest gave dignity to the scene by awakening a sense of possible danger all these and every other accompaniment of this noble scene captain dalgetty might have marked if he had been so minded but to confess the truth the gallant captain who had eaten nothing since daybreak was chiefly interested by the smoke which ascended from the castle chimneys and the expectations which this seemed to warrant of his encountering an abundant stock of provent as he was wont to call supplies of this nature the boat soon approached the rugged pier which abutted into the loch from the little town of inverary then a rude assemblage of huts with a very few stone mansions interspersed stretching upwards from the banks of loch fine to the principal gate of the castle before which a scene presented itself that might easily have quelled a less stout heart and turned a more delicate stomach than those of rittmaster dugald dalgetty titular of drumthwacket chapter eleven